Hello and welcome to the second part of our February 2013 Internet Storm Center monthly threat update. In uh, this uh, second part, I'll be focusing on IPv6 and our title here is Busting IPv6 Myths. What I'll be talking about is various misconceptions that people have about IPv6. And uh, this really leads up uh, to a series of events that we have coming this year, focusing on IPv6, starting in March with our IPv6 uh, Focus Month. That's something that uh, we at the Internet Storm Center sort of came up with, so it's not a national IPv6 Focus Month or anything like this. But uh, there are a number of issues that really we want to draw attention to and uh, this is kind of what this focus month is about if you have any stories or anything you want to share we do invite uh, guest diaries uh, for uh, this series we may do them daily every other day whatever way it comes out you know? And then in June, we do have on the 14th, our annual IPv6 summit. Third time that we are doing that. And uh, we are working with some great speakers again that will share some uh, first-hand uh, stories about IPv6. In particular, of course, from a security perspective. And then that's uh, followed uh, by our IPv6 uh, class, which uh, will be sort of the start of a uh, sans fire in Washington, D.C and then again that's uh, june 14th 15th and 16th so if you want to learn more about this it's isc.sans.edu slash ipv6 this url will then point to the respective uh, class or summit or whatever we have uh, going on well, so a quick outline here about our presentation. We'll start with a quick introduction and uh, then essentially go through a couple of myths here. You know, whether or not you have or need IPv6, how well they supported, some of the myths that are still going around about features like encryption quality of service, and uh, then a little bit about uh, the security issues uh, with IPv6. So very quick introduction, of course, uh, the killer feature is the large address space, but uh, really IPv6 is also a big cleanup and modernization of IPv4. IPv4 was developed for a network for the kind of hardware that really no longer exists. And IPv6 in part uh, modernizes the protocol. Uh, with that, we do get a streamlined header. Uh, this is the IPv6 header. There's a lot of stuff missing uh, that you're used to in IPv4. For example, fragmentation, uh, checksums and such is gone. It's uh, really a much leaner header than we have in IPv4. However, it's also more extendable. And uh, this is sort of one of the real big changes when it comes uh, to IPv6, and that's the introduction of extension headers. Extension headers fit in between the IP header and then the protocol header, like in this example, TCP. You may have several of them. Now, most packets, and uh, I would just guess 98% of packets, do not have any extension headers. They just have an IP IP header and then a protocol header. But if you want to, for example, uh, do something like source routing, if you have fragmentation and uh, such, if you want to take advantage of some of uh, the new uh, quality of service protocols, uh, then you need extension headers. So you may have one or more extension headers, but they're optional. And just uh, to summarize this introduction again, uh, focus back on why do we need IPv6? Uh, what's so different about it? It's really the focus on modern networks, modern hardware. IPv4 was designed around a research network that was built using 70s and 80s hardware. So a lot of it is sort of built around 16 bits, in some cases, 32 bit hardware. Uh, the packet sizes and such are all sort of in kilobyte increments. Uh, 
network speeds and latencies are really sort of considered to be relatively slow compared to modern networks. And uh, then, uh, for example, there were no wireless networks when IPv4 was originally designed. IPv6 really overhauls a lot of this. It's built around 64-bit hardware. Everything in the header delineates at 64-bit boundaries. It can take advantage of gigabytes of system memory. And then of course it's built for faster networks. It streamlines routing, and then it takes into account things like wireless networks. A lot of these features of course were in part sort of retrofitted into IPv4, but uh, never sort of properly integrated. And in many ways, IPv6 uh, doesn't provide an awful lot of new features, but it properly integrates a lot of the stuff that sort of got bolded on to IPv4 over the years. And for example, extension headers is one way this is done. Well, uh, enough of an introduction, so let's talk about our first myth, and that myth is, well, I don't have IPv6. So let me do a quick demo here with a couple of modern operating systems and uh, see how they support IPv6. So let's take a look at uh, how different operating systems deal with IPv6. I got a couple of operating systems set up here as a virtual machine. All of these uh, virtual machines are connected to the VMware switch in the NAT setting. So they don't have any native IPv6 uh, connectivity. If I'm looking here at uh, this uh, Windows 8 system, you will see that I do have a link local only address here uh, for my default Ethernet adapter. So uh, this could be used then, for example, to configure IPv6 via router advertisements. But I also do have a fully routable IPv6 address here. This is a Teredo detunneling protocol, which is enabled by default in Windows Windows 7 and Windows 8 unless you're connected to an active domain. This system here is of course standalone, so this is why this is enabled. Let's uh, take a quick look here at how uh, this uh, looks in uh, Windows 7. Windows 7, uh, pretty much the same thing. So if I'm typing ipconfig, I do have my default Ethernet adapter here with a link local address, and I do have the Teredo adapter with a Teredo tunnel address. And then uh, just so it's not left out, let's take a look at uh, OS 10. This is uh, the default uh, configuration in OS 10 IF config, of course. You do see again that I do have a link local address. Now we don't see a tunnel here. The tunnel will be enabled once you start the back to my Mac feature and I'm SSH here into a second system that has it enabled. And uh, here you do see these, this U-ton adapter uh, that is being set up uh, for back to my Mac. So it uses IPv6 via this tunnel, even though uh, this particular system here has a uh, full native uh, dual stack IPv6 uh, configuration. It still starts up uh, this tunnel adapter for back to my Mac. And uh, if you want to play with this, uh, just uh, try to turn on back to my Mac in the iCloud setting and uh, turn it off and on and see how this U-ton adapter starts up and then disappears. Now, one question that comes up a lot is whether or not you should disable IPv6 if you don't need it. That's actually a little bit uh, controversial. By default, I would suggest uh, that you disable stuff you don't need. However, uh, read in particular for Windows carefully the IPv6 for Windows FAQ that I have up here and the associated knowledge base article as to how to turn off IPv6 in Windows 7 and Windows 8. The problem you run into is that it's no longer an officially supported and tested configuration if you do so. And uh, there is a specific reason for that. In order to illustrate this, let me show you here yet another uh, virtual system. And uh, that's a Linux system running a CentOS. 
I am uh, just actually assaged into it and uh, already kind of uh, crapped what I want to show you here. That's just an excerpt from a Netstat. And what you're seeing here looks at first uh, like an IPv4 address that uh, 10.128.0.11. But if you look closer, it's actually an IPv6 address. Operating systems or modern operating systems internally represent all IP addresses as IPv6 addresses. So just to summarize this, you do have IPv6, uh, you may not uh, want it, you may think you don't need it, uh, but the operating system is really built around IPv6, which gets me to the next myth. Uh, I don't need IPv6. That's the reason why people usually ask whether or not they should and how they should disable IPv6. Well, first of all, it may not really depend on you. You may decide that you don't need IPv6, but uh, what about your suppliers, business partners? If you want to keep talking to them and they implement IPv6, they may in the future actually switch to IPv6 only networks, then you you're left behind. So it may not really depend on you. For example, a lot of people think that they don't need IPv6 as long as they have enough IPv4 space. Well, uh, if you are, for example, dealing with uh, business partners in Asia that run out of IPv4 space, then you may be forced to move along. And then, of course, there's a whole new set of applications that really will benefit uh, from IPv6. Mobile networks, I put down here, storage air networks, cloud computing, also a lot of uh, security technologies like, for example, end-to-end -end encryption via IPsec uh, will get easier with IPv6. And in the end, it really comes down to that the alternatives are uglier and worse. For example, a carrier crate NAT I have here and IPv4 really sort of is running into its design limitations. And a lot of the features that sort of work in IPv4 will be a proper part of the protocol in IPv6. Now, if Windows doesn't even allow us to turn off IPv6, does that mean that your devices, your software can be assumed to be ready for it? Well, uh, sadly not. Uh, there's a lot of uh, software in particular out there that's not yet ready for IPv6 that was not written in this IP version agnostic way and in particular software that's not necessarily networking software but software that's logging and using IP addresses. For example, your log analysis systems and such. They're the ones that are probably the hardest to enumerate. Essentially, everything that uses IP addresses has to be checked whether or not it's able to deal with IPv6 addresses. And then of course, even if there may be a firmware update available, it's not necessarily a given that the particular hardware is ready for IPv6 to be able to process it correctly. Just uh, earlier today, I had an issue with my cable modem and uh, I was looking at its configuration page and figured out that, yep, they loaded a new firmware on it that is now IPv6 enabled. But ever since then, the modem has serious performance issues. So I haven't really 100% verified this yet, yet, but it's very possible that that the firmware upgrade that enabled IPv6 caused enough additional overhead to the cable modem to no longer support networking properly. And then you also got some little quirks to be aware of. For example, here I have an, as an example how to use IP address in a URL. You have to enclose it in square brackets in IPv6. That's for the simple reason that uh, MIME uses a colon as a delimiter. So in an IP address in IPv4, you could have an IP address colon the port number. By putting it in square brackets, you essentially tell the browser that these colons are part of the IP address and not meant to delimit a port. Of course, at the end, after the closed square bracket, you could still have a colon 80, a colon 81, or whatever. And another thing I keep hearing is that 
with ipv6 all your traffic will be encrypted well uh, that's just not true the reason why people assume that is that with ipv6 ipsec becomes a mandatory component of the ip stack in ipv4 you typically have to install something like a vpn client or such in addition to just enabling ipv4 if you ever enable ipv4 well uh, but it being a mandatory component of the stack does doesn't mean it's configured you still have to configure it that's still not terribly easy you still probably have to install additional software to do that so uh, not really a game changer here however down the road by having it as a man mandatory component on all systems that speak ipv6 there may be a tendency to enable it more often and it may also be become easier to do end-to-end -end ipsec uh, versus just a gateway to gateway next we have a quality of service now uh, this was sort of one goal of ipv6 to improve quality of service and with that uh, also routing now in the IPv6 header itself, we still only have one byte for the type of service, the traffic class as it's called in IPv6. And really all it does is it follows the more modern differentiated services definition of IPv4. Now uh, down the road, there are a couple of emerging uh, protocols that uh, you may use to get more fine grained uh, sort of quality of service features. Like for example, RSVP, the resource reservation protocol, Yes, you can do that in IPv4, but uh, in IPv6 with hop by hop headers and router alerts, uh, it's a bit better integrated to the protocol, but it's still not authenticated. Uh, with a routing reservation protocol, you can, for example, tell a router that you expect a certain amount of bandwidth to be available. The router may ignore it or the router may just not have enough bandwidth to fulfill uh, this request. So uh, this is nothing really that's meant for public networks. In internal networks, it may work quite well to sort of reserve bandwidth for video streams and such. And then lastly, probably uh, the reason why most people are afraid of IPv6, and that's the fact that in IPv6, in its uh, default uh, configuration, you will end up with uh, public routable IPv6 addresses on each host. That's kind of the point of IPv6. We now have enough addresses to no longer have to deal with NAT. And of course, for many of us, NAT was a security feature, even though it was never supposed to be a security feature. And then of course, if you think about it, it it just didn't work as a security feature. Most exploits these days that people are afraid of come as an email attachment, as a URL the user clicks on and they then attack the client. So the user initiates the connection and really nothing is going to stop the user from going to the respective malicious URL unless you have something, for example, like a proxy. And well, that's what you can still have. You can still set up a proxy. You don't have have to assign global addresses. Now you actually have complete isolation. And I do have another YouTube video about just how to survive without NAT in IPv6 by using something called unique local addresses. And then of course, firewalls still exist. They still exist for your network. They still exist host-based. Windows by default comes with a firewall enabled on the host. So for IPv4, for IPv6, all inbound connections will be blocked. However, you should become familiar with how to configure this firewall correctly. Whether or not, for example, IPv4 and IPv6 is blocked or opened up if you add a certain rule to it. Well, uh, this is it as far as the IPv6 myths go. We'll have more details during our IPv6 uh, focus month. If you do have any questions, please email to handler at sans.edu or just uh, use the contact form on the isc.sans.edu page. Thanks for listening.